Kia ora everybody. Uh, Bruce Arrell is my name. I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit, and it's my pleasure to introduce Gina O'Grady, who's a paediatric neurologist at Starship, and she has an interest in neuromuscular conditions. Um, she has been involved in the rollout of the medication we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, spinal muscular atrophy. So Gina, over to you. We look forward to your talk. Kenakoto Katoa, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you about a topic that's really important to me. Um, and thank you for giving up your time to come and learn about this condition, which, you know, as Bruce has said, is is, is rare, but um, as we'll talk about, early diagnosis is really important. So I'm going to be talking about floppy babies. Um, could they have spinal muscular atrophy? But also talk about just an approach to a floppy baby in general, talk about recognition and diagnosis of SMA, and then talk about our newly funded therapies. So my disclosures, I have received consultancy fees from both Biogen and Roche. So spinal muscular atrophy, in brief, is a neuromuscular disease that can present in infancy, childhood, or adulthood. It's a condition which affects the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord, it causes muscle atrophy, and this causes progressive muscle weakness. The manifestations are quite variable, so it can present in really severe form in infancy, but can also present in the adult population as well. And particularly in the more severe forms, there's multi-system impact. In the instance, it's pretty stable world right, worldwide at around about 1 in 10,000, which does make it the most common genetic cause of death in infancy, particularly without treatment. So before we launch into SMA, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how children with a neuromuscular condition might present a general approach to assessment of a floppy baby, and then moving to talk more specifically about SMA, focusing on early recognition and diagnosis to give you an awareness of the treatment options um, and just the um, expected results from therapy, and then to talk a little bit about newborn screening. So there are a number of different ways that a neuromuscular condition could present in childhood. So in a very severe condition, there could be antenatal onset. A mother might notice reduced fetal movements. Polyhydramnios could be present due to reduced swallowing. And arthrogryposis, which is multiple joint contractures evident at birth, which can be a result of reduced movement in utero. So these babies would often present at delivery. They might require respiratory support from the time of delivery and would usually need transfer to a baby unit. In infancy, appearance concerns could be that the baby is floppy, it's not meeting developmental milestones, or it's not gaining weight. And the more traditional signs and symptoms would be hypertonia, reduced anti-gravity movements, a weak cry, breathing difficulties and feeding difficulties. In an older child, your examination becomes much more like a sort of a typical neurological examination. Parents' concerns might be that the child's not keeping up with their peers, they have difficulty running, they're not very good at sports, um, that they tire easily is quite a common complaint or that they're falling frequently. And then you can do a more traditional exam looking for muscle weakness and muscle wasting, calf pseudohypertrophy, sort of bulky calves, which can be a feature for boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, low muscle tone, hyporeflexia or areflexia, and toe walking. Wasara can be multiple different reasons for toe walking. One of the differentials that we definitely think about is muscle weakness. And I just wanted to flag two other little aspects that whilst we do think of neuromuscular conditions as being peripheral disorders that don't affect the brain or cognition, there are some neuromuscular conditions where there can be delayed cognitive abilities, um, language development delays, um, or autistic phenotypes. So particularly for boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, they can present sort of at two, three years of age with language delay, a little bit autistic, before the weakness becomes more obvious. And also for congenital myotonic dystrophy, one of our other more common um, infant onset neuromuscular diseases. And just one other little flag. So in anyone you see with elevated transaminases, um, it's always good to check a CK level. So transaminases are also released from muscle. So if there's no elevation of GGT or ALP, it's good to think about whether the transaminase could actually be coming from muscle.
So just moving to a general approach to assessment of a floppy baby. So when we're examining a baby, we're sort of trying to think in our mind about whether a baby is floppy weak or floppy strong. And what we mean by that, so a floppy weak baby is a baby who's got low muscle tone, but they also have muscle weakness. And so in a little infant, a lot of that is based on examination and do they have anti-gravity movement. And that clinical picture makes you think much more about a neuromuscular disease as to a floppy strong picture where babies are floppy, but actually they have really good anti-gravity movements. They can lift their limbs, they can lift their legs up off the bed so they don't have any muscle weakness. And that is much more suggestive of a central nervous system problem, perhaps a hypoxic ischemic insult, chromosomal syndromic, Prader-Willi is the sort of classic one, um, metabolic conditions. And then there are always some babies where it's just really difficult to tell. Um, assessing mild degrees of weakness in an infant is difficult um, and often is just monitoring their progress over time until that becomes more apparent and sort of pursuing both diagnostic possibilities. So when we're looking at a floppy baby, a lot of it is based on observation. Um, so when the baby is lying supine, they have that classic um, hypotonic frog leg posture. Um, we'd be looking for contractures, which can be a sign of reduced movement in utero, and really looking to see is there any anti-gravity movement. So whilst a normal baby lifts, flex its hips, lifts its legs up off the bed, a baby with SMA can't do that. Um, and same for upper arms, whilst you might see them lift their hands and their forearms up off the bed, you'll find that they can't lift their upper arms up off the bed. It's important to look at the chest shape for that sort of classical bell-shaped chest, which is a marker of poor chest wall development. Um, paradoxical breathing, so you see a lot more abdominal excursion than you do chest excursion, and that's due to relative preservation of the diaphragm strength compared with the intercostal muscles. A baby might have noisy breathing, they're not managing their saliva and they've got pulled secretions at the back of the throat. They might have a weak cry or a weak cough. Looking at their face, um, babies with SMA, we'll talk about, I normally have a really bright alert face, but for lots of our muscle conditions, babies can have a weak face. They might not be able to do a good smile. And they often have sort of an unusual appearance to the face with quite a long face, what we call a myopathic face and a high arched palate. So you're looking to see, you know, does the baby have preservation of their cognitive development? Do they have make good eye contact, good social interaction, and then thinking about their reflexes. So I was just going to show you this video. There's of a baby with SMA, and you'll see, you know, compared with a normal infant who would be lifting their legs, lifting their arms, he's not able to lift his arms or legs up off the bed, can lift his forearms up off the bed, but not able to lift his upper arms. Another thing you're looking at is when you get the baby to make eye contact with you, can they move their head from side to side through the midline? So this little baby, it's not definitely tested in this video, but, you know, might have its head over to the side, might be too weak to be able to bring its head back to the midline. And so then we would move on to what we call a 180 degree exam. And so the first step is pulling a baby up to sitting and sort of looking at the degree of head control with a baby who's really floppy. When you pull up on their arms, you sort of get that sensation that you might sublux their shoulders. With a baby that floppy, you'd want to provide a little bit of um, support for their head. When you get the baby to sitting, you're putting them in a sitting or supported sitting position. And it's a good opportunity to look at what their head control is like in a sitting position. Then lifting them up into that position of vertical suspension. And when a real baby is really floppy, you get the sensation when you're holding them under their arms that they're really going to slip through and sort of fall through your hands. Are they able to lift their legs up, flex their hips, moving their own over into ventral suspension? Um, looking to see whether they flop over your hand or whether they can lift their hips up a little bit. Again, can they flex their hips? Can they lift and extend their head? And then down into prone, where depending on the age, you know, the baby will either be able to lift its head or prop up onto its forearms. Examination of an older child is much more like a sort of typical neuromuscular or neurology examination, although 
I find that functional maneuvers are often more helpful. It can be really difficult when getting a child to do sort of a formal power assessment. Are they truly doing five over five power? Is that their full effort? So looking at their gait is important. Children who are weak will walk with a wide base gait. They've got a Trendelenburg hip sway as their sort of pelvis waddle side to side, reduced to a weakness of the pelvic stabilizers. Um, and toe walking can be a compensatory mechanism for muscle weakness. This little boy on the right um, actually has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but he's demonstrating what's called a Gower maneuver. So you ask the child to lie on their back. They roll themselves over to their stomach and then get themselves up to standing. And you can see that he's using his arms to walk up his legs to get himself up to a standing position. And so while the, that maneuver is often associated with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it's not a, condition, a maneuver that's unique to that condition. It's just a marker of proximal muscle weakness in children. Lesser degrees of weakness um, you could bring out with some other maneuvers. I often get children to squat to see if they can maintain that position. Can they kind of waddle across the floor like a duck in that squat position? You know, if a child can do that, they've got really very good proximal strength. Getting them to do a high kneel requires quite a lot of stability around the hip girdle. Um, can they kneel with one foot in front of the other? Can they swap from one leg to the other? Are they able to climb up stairs? Can they do a push-up? Can they do a sit-up? And then moving on to check their reflexes. And so just a little bit about reflexes. So when we're thinking about neuromuscular conditions, we're sort of trying to localize the lesion to what's called the motor unit. So we think of the signal to move as coming from the brain, traveling down the upper motor neuron, synapsing in the spinal cord with the anterior horn cell, traveling down the lower motor neuron, um, synapsing with the muscle at the neuromuscular junction, and then the muscle itself. And so if you have a central cause, your reflexes are normal, or you know, perhaps in the case of a brain injury, HIE, brisk um, or increased reflexes, lesions at the anterior horn cell present with absent reflexes, so that's where spinal muscular atrophy fits in. Children with peripheral nerve difficulties have decreased or absent reflexes. If there's a junction uh, problem at the neuromuscular junction, you actually have normal reflexes and muscle conditions are normally associated with decreased reflexes. So moving on to talk a little bit more specifically about SMA. So it's an autosomal recessive genetic condition. And so that means um, we've got two copies of our SMN1 gene. We get one copy from mum, one copy from dad. And to have SMA, you need to have a mutation in both copies of that SMN1 gene. And then your body can't make survival motor neuron protein. And this is really important for the um, motor neurons, which sit in the anterior horn cell of the spinal cord. And so if you don't have survival motor neuron protein, you get progressive loss of your motor neurons, denervation of muscles and muscle atrophy. So the carrier frequency of SMA is quite high. So it's, that's why it is sort of one of the more common genetic conditions. So one in four, one in 54 individuals in the populations are carriers of SMA. And so a carrier parent is healthy. They don't have any muscle weakness. They wouldn't have any way of knowing that they're a carrier of SMA without prior testing. And so if two carrier parents meet and have a child, there's a one in four chance that that child will get the mutated copy from each parent and have SMA. So the incidence is around about one in 10,000. So, you know, with our birth rate, we'd sort of expect to diagnose five to six people per year with SMA. In 2019, we did a New Zealand wide incidence prevalence study and identified 71 individuals living with SMA in New Zealand. And over a three-year period, found an incidence of 0.8 in 10,000, so pretty consistent with international figures. It's a condition which affects all ethnicities. And one other real key point from that study is that nearly a quarter of our families had more than one affected child. And that's because children are often diagnosed at that sort of one to two years of age where a family might already be pregnant or have had another child. And so it's a devastating diagnosis and to have two affected children is an enormous burden for a family. 
So you might have heard us talking about different types of SMA. So the historical classification of SMA is really based on your maximum motor milestone um, and your age of presentation. So type 1 SMA is defined as onset before six months of age um, and children don't achieve the ability to sit independently. So it is the most common type of SMA, makes up about 60% of SMA. Children with type 2 SMA have onset between 6 and 18 months of age. They're the sitters, so they learn to sit independently, but they never achieve the ability to walk independently. And children with type 3 SMA, so we have a childhood onset after 12 months, they learn to walk independently. They might walk late, and it's a progressive condition, so they could potentially lose the ability to walk over time. Type 4 SMA you know, is uncommon, sort of less than 1% of the SMA population, but is the adult onset disease. And so while type 1 SMA is you know, the most common type, because without treatment, children with type 1 SMA historically didn't survive in a clinic population, children with type 2 SMA would be the most common group of kids. And so the life expectancy for type 1 SMA is less than two years of age. Children with type 2 SMA would learn, live into, most would live into adulthood, and individuals with type 3 and type 4 SMA have normal or near normal life expectancy. So individuals with type 1 SMA might look normal at birth, um, but normally present by a few months of age. And so that's often because they're not achieving head control or some might gain head control, but then subsequently lose their head control. Um, like we've discussed for a floppy baby, they've got that hypertonic frog leg posture, that paucity of anti-gravity movement. They will often have a weak cry and weak cough. Um, if you look in the mouth, you might see tongue fasciculations. It's not present in everyone with SMA, but sort of a quivering appearance to the tongue, which can be a diagnostic clue. And like I've said, infants with SMA have really bright, alert um, faces. They don't have any facial weakness, and they're really cognitively normal. Infants are really social and engaging, which can be quite misleading. So, you know, unless you unwrap the baby, if they're just in mum's arms wrapped and you're not looking at their movements, you know, they, they could look sort of misleadingly bright and um, healthy. They have absent reflexes and they're, you know, they're really definitely absent. No matter how hard you tap on their knees, you can't get any reflexes. Um, we look at their chest shape. They've got that sort of bell-shaped chest, that um, abdominal excursion, abdominal breathing. And then most will have quite significant bulbar dysfunction. So that gives them difficulty with their feeding. They'll often have poor weight gain. And so without treatment, it's a really devastating um, progressive condition. So at least half will die quite quickly within the first few months of age and almost all are deceased by two years of age. Children with type 2 SMA learn to sit independently but then their motor milestones sort of start to plateau. Some might go on to crawl, but they never go on to walk independently. And so these are kids who would spend a lot of their time in a um, power wheelchair. Um, and in younger children, you can still see them gain some motor milestones, not to walking, but they're sort of at that developmental age where they're still gaining skills. And then as they get older, they have that progressive proximal muscle weakness, so they tend to lose strength, particularly of their upper limbs. A clue in a younger child might be a tremor of their hands. They can have quite tremulous hand movements. Um, life expectancy is variable. So this is this is all a spectrum. So there are some children with type 2 SMA who would sort of be closer in phenotype to type 1 SMA and have quite a severe presentation. But most would live into their adult years, perhaps 30s or 40s. These kids have a lot of orthopedic complications, which comes with being non-ambulant and with muscle weakness or high risk of scoliosis. Lots of them will have um, spine surgery, joint contractures, and often need hip surgery. And they are commonly in hospital, so they have frequent chest infections. Um, 
most would use nocturnal non-invasive respiratory support and we use this quite proactively to try and support their airway clearance support healthy chest development and also chest wall development and once again SMA doesn't affect your brain so these kids are usually really bright alert intelligent engaging little kids so this little girl has SMA and you can see she can um, get to a sitting position, but she has trouble getting herself up to a sitting position and sort of uses a gal or tight maneuver to use her hands to walk herself up to sitting. Once again, reflexes would be absent, might be a little bit tremulous, but as you can see from the photo, she just looks really bright and engaging. So children with type 3 SMA present after 18 months of age. So they do learn to walk independently. They might be late in meeting that milestone. And because it's a progressive condition, they might later lose the ability to walk. So there is a um, subtype called 3A, which refers to onset less than three years of age. And these children have a higher risk of loss of ambulation. They also get progressive proximal weakness or around the hip girdle but also around the shoulder girdle as well and while most will have decreased reflexes they're not always universally absent so you might have a child who's got absent ankle reflexes for example but you can still get them at the knees they might also be a little bit tremulous but they have much less of the other complications so they wouldn't normally have bulbar dysfunction um, or the respiratory complications Although those who do lose ambulation are more like type 2 SMA and their complications, and they do have a higher risk of scoliosis and orthopedic complications. I wanted to show you this um, video. It's a really nice examination of a gait. So it, it, you know, wouldn't, it is a child with SMA, but it could be a child with another cause of muscle weakness as well. So you can see that reduced muscle bulk in his thighs. And when he's walking, so he's got that tendency to stand on his toes. He's not quite getting a heel strike with his gait. And you can see that real, that's the Trendelenburg hip sway, that sort of waddle of his pelvis from side to side. Kids, of course, are prone to frequent falling. And then when he gets himself up to standing, that's that gower maneuver using his hands to walk himself up his legs. And you can also see that um, sort of increased protuberance of his tummy, which is related to the increased lumbar lordosis. So it is a trial with SMA, but you know it could equally be a child with another cause of muscle weakness. So what I really want from this talk is that you know you, you're aware of SMA, you've got a high clinical suspicion for this diagnosis, and we really need to see these babies and children quickly. So someone with type 1 SMA would be wanting to see within days um, and someone with type 2, 3 SMA with week, within weeks. And the reason for that, as I talk about, is that the sooner that you can start treatment and stop the loss of motor neurons, the better their longer term prognosis is going to be. And so exactly who is going to do that review is going to depend where you are in the country. Um, there are neurologists based in Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch so it might be by a neurologist but if you're somewhere more provincial that first assessment by might be by a pediatrician and I think if you're not sure how to get that really quick review I would pick up the phone and talk to the on-call neurologist or talk to the on-call pediatrician for your area. When we see a baby or child with a sort of strong clinical suspicion of SMA, we move direct to the genetic testing, which is done in New Zealand in the Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch labs. And what we're looking for is deletion of exon 7 of the SMN1 gene. And the turnaround time can be sort of up to four weeks. So if we're really strongly suspicious, um, you know, we'd talk to the lab and try and get that done sort of within about a week. So I'll just talk briefly about the genetics because it is a little bit confusing, but it is helpful in trying to understand why there is this broad spectrum of severity for patients. So we all have two genes. We all have an SMN1 gene and an SMN2 gene. And so the SMN2 gene is something sort of like a copy of the SMN1 gene, which differs at one nucleotide has arisen in, um, evolutionarily. For a healthy individual, um, it, it doesn't do anything. 
So all of our SMN1 protein is made, so SMN protein is made from the SMN1 gene. The SMN2 gene differs at one nucleotide and the exon 7 is not included in the transcript that's made from the SMN2 gene. It's when you have SMA, SMA that the number of copies of the SMN2 gene starts to become really important. So we all have differing numbers of copies. If you have a mutation in both copies of your SMN1 gene, you can't make SMN protein. Whilst most of the protein produced from the SMN2 gene is not functioning protein, due to what's called like leaky splicing, occasionally exon 7 does get included in the transcript made from the gene. And so perhaps about 10% of the protein that's made from the SMN2 gene is actually functional SMN protein. And so the more copies you have of SMN2, is the best known predictor of the severity of SMA. So babies who have got type 1 SMA mostly have only two copies of the SMN2 gene. With three copies, you might have type 2 or type 3 SMA. And individuals who've got four copies of SMN2 or higher have milder disease, so SMA3 or more that adult onset SMA4. So it's all the same genetic condition, and it's it's not SMN2 is not the only modifier, but it is one of the key modifiers of presentation. So I'm sometimes asked if you know there are other investigations that you should be doing. I mean, I think really the priority remains urgent referral and review if the clinical suspicion is SMA. But other investigations could possibly include a full blood count, electrolytes, liver function. We're looking for sort of other multi-system involvement, vitamin B12, always thinking about correctable conditions, a CK level and a urine metabolic screen. And just a brief mention on CK. So um, normal is less than 200. We see some children with grossly elevated CKs, so 5,000, but even up to 10 to 20,000. So that level of CK, particularly in a young boy, is very strongly suggestive of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There are a whole range of other limb girdle muscular dystrophies, so other genetic muscular conditions where there can also be elevated CK. Becker muscular dystrophy is sort of a milder form of dystrophinopathy. Again, that CK is sort of in the 1,000 to 5,000 level. I just wanted to mention that some babies with SMA and myotonic dystrophy will also have a mild elevation of CK, so it sort of might be 300, 500. Um, it doesn't, it's not always elevated, so if the um, CK is normal, it certainly doesn't exclude it. And it's just important to remember that when you're trying to get blood from a child, it's not always easy, so related to perhaps the tourniquet application, um, if it's a difficult collect, you can have a spurious elevation of CK. And remember if there's isolated elevation of transaminases just to think about whether that could be coming from muscle. So moving on to treatments, um, we now have two funded treatment options in New Zealand. So nusinersen, which is given by the intrathecal method and has been funded from January of this year. And ristaplam um, is given orally and has been funded from yesterday. And there are other funded um, medicines that are not yet approved by MedSafe for use in New Zealand, um, are approved by the FDA and are being used in Australia. So on the Australian PBS, and that's on the Synogene Abipavavec, which is the gene therapy for SMA. And so just looking briefly at how these treatments work. So the gene therapy is using what's called an AAV9 viral vector, and you're trying to deliver back into cells a full functioning copy of the SMN1 gene. Nusinersen and Ristaplam are both splice modifying treatments. So they're actually working on that SMN2 gene, and they're trying to sort of trick the protein making machinery into incorporating exon 7 into the transcript produced from SMN2, such that you get full length SMN protein from the SMN2 gene. And so the approval criteria are children 18 years of age or under who've got signs and symptoms of SMA one, two or three prior to the age of three years, 
um, or for a pre-symptomatic infant who has three or less copies of SMN2, which you really only get with a newborn screening program or perhaps in a family where they've had a previous affected child have opted against sort of genetic testing in pregnancy um, and a child is tested at birth. And so both are working to promote that inclusion of exon 7 into the SMN2 gene. Nusinersen is given by intrathecal injection. So children have four loading doses in the first two months and then go into four monthly maintenance injections. It's a really very well tolerated medication and the side effects are mostly related to the mode of delivery. So related to the lumbar puncture, such as back pain or post lumbar puncture headache or sedation used for administration. Ristoplam is given as a daily oral medicine and again as a very well tolerated medicine without any serious adverse events. And so for any individual child, we are sort of speaking with the Bano about their preferences. So clinical suitability, so older children who've got a significant scoliosis, it might be really difficult to do an intrathecal injection. Their respiratory function is important if they're going to need sedation or a general anesthetic for treatment. Um, the mode of delivery is important that intrathecal injection that currently has been given Wellington, Christchurch and Auckland. So obviously the family would need to be able to travel to the treatment centre and the family preference is really important. So some families prefer having an injection every four months and not having to think about remembering a medicine on a day-to-day -day basis and others would much rather give a oral medication. So when we're starting treatment, we think about individual goals, and we'll talk about this, but it's very much based on the age of the child. Um, talking with the family about what the expected outcomes might be, and then we set them up with physio OT assessments to monitor their response to treatment. So I was going to talk a little bit more about Nusinus, and just to give you an idea of the expected results from treatment. So as I've said, this is trying to kind of trick the body into making more functional SMN protein from the SMN2 gene. And so children have these four loading doses over the first two months in their four monthly treatment. It's basically a lumbar puncture procedure. The medicine is injected over about a minute. And currently we're doing that at Stash at Wellington or Christchurch hospitals. And how we give that depends on the child. So younger children often you know, manage fine on our ward with some sedation. Children who get to three and a bit stronger and a bit wigglier gets a bit more difficult and often need a general anesthetic. And then much older children, we could often move back to being able to do it on the ward with play specialist input. And so the outcome is really variable and it depends on the time at which you're starting treatment. So if you're picking up infants with a newborn screening program and treating them pre-symptomatically versus an infant who's presented with type 1 SMA, um, young children who present with a new diagnosis of type 2 or 3, and then we've got a cohort of older children who've got more established disease who have not had prior access to therapy. And across all of the clinical trials for all of the different treatment modalities, one thing is really very clear that your outcomes are best with early access to therapy. And the reason for that makes sense. This is a condition which is progressive. You're losing your motor neurons. And so in infants with type 1 SMA, you can see that they lose almost all of their motor neurons really very quickly. So your window for getting in to stop motor neuron loss really needs to be sort of within that first month, two months of life. Children with type 2 SMA have also lost a significant proportion of their motor neurons in those first few months of life. And children with type 3 SMA are losing motor neurons, but not quite so quickly. So the sooner you can start a treatment and stop the most loss of motor neurons, the better that child is going to do. So just to talk about pre-symptomatic treatment, because this, this is really the goal and this is you know, where we should be headed, that if you take a group of infants like um, Biden did in the nurture study and treat them based on newborn screening, such that they're starting treatment before six weeks of age, um, they've got two or three copies of SMN2, so they're babies who would have been predicted to have type 1 or type 2 SMA, then you see a very dramatic deviation from natural history. 
So at two years of age, 72% of these treated infants didn't show any clinical manifestations of SMA, and those that did had quite mild manifestations. So all were alive, none were on any permanent ventilation, three were using some nocturnal respiratory support. All of them could sit, and almost all of them were walking, um, particularly in the group who had three copies of SMN2. And a significant proportion of these children were meeting their milestones at age-appropriate timeframes. So you get a really very good response if you can get in early with treatment. So particularly if you've got three copies. So three copies, we would be looking for normal motor development. Um, some will be able to run. They're not developing complications such as scoliosis. If you've got two copies, some will still have some swallowing or respiratory involvement. They might have delay in motor milestones, but they achieve walking. Some will still have ongoing gait instability. And so I just wanted to show you these two videos. So Belgium has had quite a long-standing newborn treat, um, screening program. So these are two little children around 15 months or so who have both been picked up on newborn screening program, treated pre-symptomatically. And you can see that their toddler gait is sort of indistinguishable from a typically developing child. So just really remarkable responses to treatment. If on the other hand, you take a group of infants who present with symptomatic type 1 SMA, so these are babies that are within the few month, first few months of life, and you need to remember the natural history. So of course, these are children who progress really rapidly towards death or permanent ventilation, almost all are deceased by two years of age. And so treatment of these symptomatic infants does significantly prolong their survival and so event-free survival, so alive and free of permanent ventilation. So after a year of therapy, 61% of the treated children were alive compared with 32% of the control group. And what I sort of tell families is that for the first, you sort of need to be strong enough to survive that first three months of age before you really start to see the treatment curves um, deviate from each other. And so infants undoubtedly meet milestones that they wouldn't otherwise have achieved. So normally babies with SMA don't, they don't have head control, they don't learn to roll over. So you can see that over half of these infants are sitting without support. Um, some are getting up to standing, but the proportion compared with pre-symptomatic treatment who are walking and standing alone um, is much less. Respiratory comorbidity is common. Um, they'll often need support through intercurrent respiratory illnesses. Most we would start on nocturnal, um, non-invasive respiratory support, which we do use quite proactively because it is an important um, step in trying to help with airway clearance and maintain normal chest wall development. Most of these infants will have a degree of bulbar dysfunction, might require still require feeding by a nasogastric tube or by a peg tube, and most will have orthopedic complications such as scoliosis and hip sublux. So we have to be really realistic for our families who present with infants with symptomatic type 1. It's not going to bring back the motor neurons that they've already lost. It's not a cure. It sort of converts them from a type 1 to a type 2, or better if they've been treated really early. But most will still need respiratory support, extensive wraparound supports, and um, lifelong treatment. And we'd often still involve the palliative care team because they're quite fragile little children. And then we've got our older children who've got established disease um, who, and just now getting access to treatment. And again, you, know, you have to remember that the natural um, history is that this is a progressive condition that children deteriorate. So this is uh, one of the motor scales we use, the Hammersmith functional motor scale, and you can see that they're losing skills over time. And so with treatment, we'd be looking to stabilize or improve their motor outcomes. And in the clinical trial of the children who surveyed between two and 12 years at the time they started therapy, there was a 4.9 point difference in that scale after 15 months of therapy. And that represents quite clear functional improvements. So um, it, getting to sitting, might be able to get to crawling, might be able to get improved upper limb function. And then there are additional benefits um, you know, that come from sort of real world use that are not captured by clinical trial outcome measures. 
And so one of the really important ones is improved energy and stamina. So I can think of one little girl who started treatment who never could manage a full week at school and is now managing full days, full weeks at school. Another little boy who started therapy, who's always, you know, failed to thrive, um, a really poor weight gain, who came in and said he just didn't know how, how easy it was for everybody to eat, that he'd really improved it and found a lot more strength in his um, jaw muscles and chewing muscles, and had already started gaining some more weight just with improved eating abilities. And so it's I said it's a really safe medication and the complications we have are sort of more related to the lumbar puncture, such as back pain, um, or related to using sedation or anesthetic for these children. So I just want to spend the last few minutes talking about newborn screening, as I think this is really where we need to head. So we know that SMA can be diagnosed early through newborn screening, and that early diagnosis allows early access to treatment, and that early treatment leads to better clinical outcomes. So SMA1 in particular is a really devastating, rapidly progressive neuromuscular disease. It's a devastating diagnosis for any family. And you know, it was awful traveling these journeys with families. And so we need an early fast acting therapy because it's irreversible, because patients can deteriorate really very quickly. And we know that there are delays to diagnosis. And that, that has a sort of pathophysiological basis on the, the motor neuron loss and just how quickly the motor neurons are lost in these severely affected infants. So this video just really clearly demonstrates that. So the little boy on the floor is a wee boy who was diagnosed with symptomatic type 1 SMA. He's been treated with nusinersen. You see that he can sit independently. He has difficulty getting himself into that independent sitting position but you know he's undoubtedly exceeded natural history for untreated disease but his little sister was picked up in Belgium on newborn screening program which wasn't available when their older son was born and so she also has SMA but she has been treated pre-symptomatically with nusinersen and you can see that you know she's indistinguishable from a typically developing infant so I think that video really just highlights the gross difference between symptomatic treatment and pre-symptomatic treatment, which is where we need to move. So there is a proposal um, that we introduce um, screening for SMA to the New Zealand newborn screening program. And so we would be looking to detect homozygous SMN1 deletion on the dry blood spot card. And we'd be doing that analysis paired with the existing testing for severe combined immune deficiency, which, which is a genetic type of test. And so the aim would be to enable pre-symptomatic access to treatment. And so there is a recommendation from the New Zealand National Screening Advisory Committee to progress the proposal, sort of waiting for an announcement in the next few months. Unfortunately, there's not any budget attached to it yet, which makes it very hard for the National Testing Centre to move forward with any more concrete planning. But this is where things are going worldwide. So 2021, there were nine programmes worldwide, including most of the state's in the US, and there were already 3.5 million babies screened worldwide, leading to an additional 288 diagnoses. New South Wales has had a established was pilot program, which is now a well-established program. The time they published their um, pilot data, they diagnosed about 10 children. It's more now. And just recently, that's being rolled out to other states in Australia. And I think reassuringly, you know, there's enough um, screening program data know that the incidence remains fairly stable so you don't suddenly start picking up a whole lot more people that you didn't know about before the incidence sits at around that one in 10,000 and with the newborn New South Wales program they've shown that you know if you do newborn screening you can have babies in within a few days of age to meet a neurologist and um, be examined do confirmatory genetic testing and you can get children started on disease modifying treatments from as young as 10 days of age and that's really where you see the the benefits and so multidisciplinary care remains really important these are kids who are well known to a range of different specialists neurologists respiratory physicians orthopedic surgeons primary care allied health professionals and so we work to some standards of care 
documents um, to published in family friendly format and some 20 years old picture about 2018 updated guidelines. So I hope that by listening to this, you now are aware of SMA, you've got a high index of suspicion, you know, hopefully you feel more confident examining a floppy baby, um, recognizing possible SMA and have a really low threshold for investigation and referral. So, you know, please, if you're worried that someone has SMA, please ring and discuss and we'll plan to see these children as soon as possible because we see the difference um, with early treatment and what it can do. And I'm really hoping that we see New Zealand follow Australia and moving to introduction of newborn screening in New Zealand. Thank you. And I'm really happy to take questions. Thank you. Well, that was, uh, that was fabulous, Gina. What a very clear presentation you gave. So uh, that, was, that was great. Um, so we've got one question there from Warren. Uh, waiting three to four weeks for genetic tests, do you start treatment while waiting? Yeah, that's a good question. We can't do that. Um, the three to four weeks would be probably the lab's turnaround if it wasn't, if it was just sitting in their kind of routine pile. So if we admit a baby, we're really strongly suspicious that they have type 1 SMA, we would talk to the lab and they can normally get us an answer back in about a week. And it takes about a week to do our sort of baseline test, you know, assess where the baby is currently at with their breathing, sort of overnight oximetry, where they're at with their feeding and their swallowing. So we can get treatments like, um, you know, supportive treatments like nasogastric feeds and swallow assessments underway for that baby. And you know, set things up. Obviously, the families need quite a bit of education about SMA, about the different treatment options. So, you know, we need that little bit of time actually to make the decisions about treatment. I've got a few questions. I was just wondering with that nurture trial, it was that was that placebo control, was it? That or one was it? wasn't. They were sort of felt that there was enough natural history data um, that you would use the natural history for the control group. Yeah, and that, that sort of it's moved quite quickly away to you know being unethical really to have a placebo. So the, the initial trial, the the biggest trial, so um, what's called the India trial, which looked at the infants with symptomatic type one SMA, which is a pretty massive trial for a rare condition that had 121 treated infants, and they did have a placebo control group, but the trial was terminated early because the you know just the stark results mm -hmm. really, and then, and then it sort of becomes unethical. Um, not to treat a baby who you've detected as having SMA. Just some more ones there. So the medication is lifelong? It is, yeah. 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 And, and do the older, if you started like in the 30-year-olds, do they get the same benefit for the... Um... Yeah, there is, there is no um, randomised control trial for... 30 year olds um the the trial the cherish trial that looked at sort of older children they were aged 2 to 12 um so it's it's more coming from real life data for that older yeah. group so there are there are studies coming through in those older populations and they do suggest benefits they're not as good as if you start early treatment um, but you do see gross motor benefits and and some of those other things too like the improved stamina um, so it sort of depends on where that 30 year old is at. Are they, a, you know, are they an ambulant adult who's got type three or are they someone who's had type two SMA who's been untreated from five years age? So it's, you know, it's quite a mixed population at that age. So what's it like for you? Uh, I guess you've been practicing over the period of no treatment through to this, these treatments. What's it like for you to... Uh, to see these, this dramatic difference. It's almost penicillin-like, isn't it? It is dramatic. Like, you know, literally we would sort of sit and watch these videos of what, what was happening overseas and not happening here. And, you know, it kind of brings tears to your eye seeing these little children walking into clinic where, you know, the children that we're looking after were not getting access to treatment. And it's a really awful progressive condition. And probably in part because that cognitive ability is maintained so they're you know they're bright alert they're engaging they're smiling but you just watch them get weaker and to the point that they're sort of drowning in their own secretions so, so the, the tricky cause of time. mortality is respiratory is it it often is respiratory so the, yeah. that yeah. must get pretty tough near the end yeah. i would imagine respiratory the, um... failure or you know sort of intercurrent illness so they get you know some intercurrent viral illness or, or aspiration because I guess the, probably the most contact primary care would be once they're off in your hands would perhaps be dealing with the grief of the parents 
and perhaps the uh, grief when the child dies. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, you know, yes, you think back to those days and we did have a lot of primary care involvement for those children who mm. were being supported through that. Do you know if there's anybody on the, uh, on the program tonight who's had experience with, uh, with children? I've not seen anybody with this as far as I know, um, so, uh, which may be the experience of a lot of GPs. But, um, yeah, so that's um, – well, we don't seem to have any more questions, but that was a, that was a brilliantly uh, clear expose, and I really hope that screening um, comes through, actually, because that's obviously going to be quite a game-changer, isn't it? Yeah, um, and, and I think that's really where you see the sort of the cost. I mean, we don't like to think about it in terms of cost benefits, but you know, that's really where you see it the cost benefits for the health system. That if you can start that really early treatment, then you're stopping all the respiratory support, you're stopping the scoliosis surgery, uh, you're stopping all the orthopedic surgeries, and obviously the child is doing better. Uh, has anyone that. done any modeling on the on the costs of um of these things? Yeah, there is there is quite a lot of sort of health economic data coming through now. And you do need to take that longer term view to your sort of health economic modeling. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to look at that longer term picture um, to get those cost savings. Yeah. But it is particularly for early treatment, you know, if you're doing pre-symptomatic treatment, that that's really where you see the greatest cost savings. Okay. Well, we might just wrap up early, but I just wonder if you'd just like to say some final words. What um, you, you gave us your take-home message, but perhaps just repeat it again as to what yeah, you want us thank to you. do. No, that's right. I mean, clinical suspicion, like we were just really happy to hear from anyone, actually, that you know we, we know how important it is to treat early, that we will rearrange things to make things work and see these babies as soon as possible mm. so that we can get them on to treatment. And for, I mean, there will be a small number of people out there who are looking after our kids with SMA, um, and I guess one of the really important roles is being able to assess these kids quickly too. So, you know, they are kids who are quite fragile. They do have a lot of intercurrent illnesses, you know, being able to assess them in sort of a timely way. Do they have an ear infection? Do they have a chest infection? Sort of that low threshold for antibiotics is really helpful in looking after them too from a primary care point of yeah. view. And yes, if anyone's got any advocacy role with newborn screening, then yeah, feel free to well, talk we, to them. <laughs> who, 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 who should we write to? Ministry of Health or um, who, who's the... Yeah, I think, where, I think it's with the, the Nas point? National Screening Advisory Committee. So, you know, they're our committee that oversee all sites of screening and you know, National Testing Centre is for newborn screening, but of course they're over bowel screening and everything else that needs to be done yeah. as well. Yeah. But yeah, I think you know that there really is cost savings and enormous benefits for children and their family. That, that, yeah. uh, Bel those Belgian kids is pretty amazing, isn't it? They are amazing. That, that's yeah. night and day. That uh, that that video. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, fabulous work, Gina, and um, thank you very much for a very clear expose. That was that was brilliant. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your time, and yeah, thanks for everyone who's joined us to learn about SMA. Okay. Thank you very much.